Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Frequently, I hear people say, the prophet Isaiah, I just love that book. And indeed, there are wonderful chapters in this book, many messianic prophecies, things that speak about God's deliverance or, as the name Isaiah would suggest, the salvation of the Lord. But when we read the book of Isaiah in its entirety, we find that the number one theme is judgment. Now, in one sense, that shouldn't surprise us because, as I frequently say, because it's frequently taught not just in Isaiah, but throughout most of the prophets, if not all of them, and that is God's judgment gives rise to salvation. We can say it another way. The outpouring of God's wrath ultimately will bring about the establishment of the kingdom of God. You cannot have those wonderful blessings, those promises of God, God wiping away every tear so that there's no more sorrow, no more death, no more anything against his will without first there being the outpouring of judgment. And many people, I'm afraid today, forget that. And they do not teach what the Bible says about God's judgment. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the 24th chapter of Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah and chapter 24. Now, we're going to see that that principle taught, that God's judgment, after it is thoroughly completed, the outcome is something good the kingdom of God. But we're going to see that there is much more in the way of content in this 24th chapter concerning God's judgment than those good things. And that is to inform the reader, to inform all of us, that God's judgment is severe. It is harsh. It is thorough. And that's why we should be so thankful, so grateful concerning this salvation, the forgiveness of sins, what Messiah did for us when he went to the cross. Let's begin. Chapter 24 and verse 1. Now, again, the language here is poetic. There is much parallelism, as we would expect in, for example, the book of Psalms. But, but frequently, prophecy is poetry, and we see a wide variety of vocabulary in order to truly give the reader a full understanding of what God is up to. So, verse 1, behold the Lord, and this is a word for emptying something or destroying it. And both of those concepts need to be realized. There is going to be this word to make empty has to do with suffering loss. God's judgment brings about loss. Those things that were not part of his will. We see that thoroughly, for example, read the book of Revelation and chapter 18. A future prophecy about how in one hour the wealth of the world becomes none. God, and this term hour simply means in a moment. It can be time-wise even less than 60 minutes. And it speaks about God's sovereignty. What God ultimately is not committed to, 
What does not manifest his glory? God will destroy. He will cause it to suffer loss. He will empty it out. So once more, verse 1, Behold, the Lord empties the earth, and he destroys it, and he twists its faith, now face. Now, this twisting of the face of the earth, the surface of the earth, is to show a transition coming, a different character. So when a person's face is, is changed, it is not like it used to be. It speaks oftentimes about a different feeling. His face changes because he feels differently. He has a different attitude, a different framework of looking at things, a different perspective. And that's what God's judgment is going to bring, a transformation of his creation. So he twists its face, its surface. And also, a very strong word, vehefits, that is to, to cast, to move rapidly and violently. He moves, he casts away its, that's the earth's inhabitants. So not only will there be a loss of, of wealth, but a loss of of life the vast majority of the inhabitants of this world they are going to be rapidly and quickly tossed aside and they will be no more in this world they will not be part of what god is about and that is kingdom building verse 2 and it shall be as the people as the priests as the servant, as his master, as the maidservant, as her lady, as the buyer, as the seller, as the, the lender, as the borrower, as the, the one who is in debt, so also will be the carrier of it, that is, the creditor. Now, what do we have here? We have all these different positions, usually opposite one another. But under God's judgment, all these differences, everyone's going to be similar. And what is that? They are going to be in great need. They're not going to be worried about, do I need money? Have I loaned money and I'm going to give it back? Am I in a better position than that one? I have money to loan and he doesn't. I have things to sell. They need to buy them. I'm the priest. That's the person, the normal people. All those things are going to be dissolved because of God's judgment. God's judgment, we can understand this verse as being a great equalizer. It's going to put everyone in the same in an equal position and that is on the pathway to eternal destruction now i'm beginning to say more and more when we encounter scripture how serious it is we need to see that the word of god more often than not depicts that which is extremely serious and we need to approach the Word of God in a serious manner. We need to take the time to learn how to rightly interpret so we can understand God's revelation. That the man of God, the woman of God might be complete, and here's what I like, ready for every good deed. What's a good deed? A deed in obedience to the will of God. Verse, verse 3, once more we see that he, he empties the earth and he plunders. So once more what's being emphasized is this loss. He empties the earth and he plunders. For the Lord he has spoken this thing. So all of this is coming about because God has said it. Now there's something else that we need to realize about uh, Isaiah chapter 24. It is not a, a 
prophecy that's simply futuristic in Isaiah's days. Isaiah, this prophecy was not speaking about something that would be fulfilled in his lifetime or prior to the coming of Messiah, the first coming, but this is a last day prophecy. It speaks with intensity about God's ultimate judgment, his wrath, that is going to bring that change, that transformation to the world, a different, remember, the face of the earth is going to be distorted, changed, twisted, however you want to understand it, and implies a new, a different character. And the takeaway for us is this. If God wants to change the, the attitude, the appearance, the mindset of the world, how much more so do I need to change? So God is making a transition. He's making a change within his creation. And we should say, let it begin with me. Verse 4. Verse 4 is still speaking about this, this world, this earth. And it says, it's a word for mourning. The earth, that's the, the understood uh, uh, subject. It appears a little bit later on in the verse. But the earth mourns and withers or fades. And it's simply showing that it's not going to thrive. God's judgment is going to bring mourning and a fading away, a withering. And this is simply a word that shows it is a manifestation of decay. It manifests a dying process. And that's what is going to happen to creation. It is going to change by means of death. And that shouldn't surprise us because death is what brings change into my life. When Messiah died, I died with him. It's only when we die to self that we find truly a life that's pleasing to God. So verse 4, the earth mourns and withers away. And then we have another word for, for the earth, and it's the word tevel, which is the world in a broader sense. And we see in verse 4 that the world is going to be, and this word means miserable. And it speaks about something that is miserable, from the person standpoint, I am miserable. But to those who look upon me, I am loathsome. So this word, depending upon the perspective, if it's self, miserable. When someone is looking upon that miserable person, that person loathes that he doesn't want anything to do with, with such a thing. That's the state that the world's going to be in. And also uses this same word for miserable or loathsome is the exalted people of the earth. That is the ones who have a high position. Those who are, are in control, they have the finer things, a greater degree of resources and authority or power. They too, God's judgment is not going to, to escape them. In other words, so it is a judgment that is quite, as I said earlier, thorough to, to the world. Verse 5. The earth, and here's the problem. The earth has become defiled underneath its, its inhabitant. So it's not so much the earth which is to blame but rather the inhabitants of the earth. In other words, God's problem with creation is not all of creation, but it's the, the purpose of his creation, and that is humanity. We know that that saying in Judaism, last indeed, first in thought. What was made last in God's creation? Humanity. But it was the primary purpose of his creation. And therefore, man has brought corruption to creation. And therefore, we read, the earth is defiled underneath as an outcome of its inhabitants. And why is that? 
because these inhabitants, because they have transgressed. Torot. We all know the word Torah. This is Torah in the plural, meaning the laws, God's laws. It is a synonym for commandments. Now, it still speaks, and remember, this is an end-time prophecy. And when the commandments are transgressed, we find that there will not be righteousness. And without righteousness, there's no glory. And when God's glory is not being manifested, soon to follow, because the absence of his glory will come, will be manifested, his judgment. That's what he's teaching in this passage. And they have replaced the law. This is a different word for statue. They have replaced God's standard. And they have, and this is word for, for breaking, transgressing, violating would probably be the closest English word. They have violated his Brit Olam, his eternal covenant. And that eternal covenant is the one that's related to Mashiach, the Messiah. So they have violated that. How? They have not exercised faith. There is an inherent relationship between Brit Avraham Avinu, that is the Abrahamic covenant, and, and the gospel, the new covenant, that kingdom covenant. This is the one that is speaking about the eternal covenant that they have violated because they have not exercised faith specifically in the foundation of that Abrahamic covenant, which is Messiah. Look now to verse 6. Because of an absence of faith, what do we have? Verse 6, therefore the curse devours the earth. So what is the outcome of of a rejection of Torah truth, a curse. And this is one of the words. We have the word klala, that's one word. Arur is another. And this is the word Allah, which is a third word in Hebrew for curse. Therefore, the curse consumed the earth. And the inhabitants of it, they were guilty. So the word of God clearly reveals what the problem is. When we look at God's chok, his standard, his laws, his Torah, his ways, we have violated them and we are guilty. And that word for guilty can also relate to shame. Guilt produces shame in Hebrew. We have uh, one concept for, for both being guilty or being ashamed. And therefore, what's the outcome of that? Well, we have a unique word, charu, yoshve ha'aretz. Yoshve ha'aretz are the inhabitants of the earth. And what's going to happen to them? Well, recently I've been teaching, for example, in Matthew 18 and also in the book of, of Jude, and we see something. We see in both of those places, the book of Jude, just that one chapter, obviously, and in Matthew 18, Messiah speaks, as well as his half-brother, according to tradition, Yehuda, Jude, about eternal fire. And that's exactly what Isaiah says, that the inhabitants of the earth, that they are going to be burned, set ablaze with fire. And the humanity that remains will be, will be small, small in amount, verse 7. Because of that, and this is something that the prophets speak to, the produce of the land. You can look at the produce of the land and see the spiritual condition of God's people. And here we have the tirosh. This is the new wine. Look now to verse 7. The new wine mourns, and the vine is the same word for miserable or loathsome. And sighs, they sigh all the, the glad heart ones. Those who were glad in their heart, this is an idiom for perhaps rejoicing, making merry, being overjoyed. All those, they no longer have that gladness of the heart. What did they do? They, they sigh. 
And this word for sign means an expression of, of grief, of sorrow, or pain, of great, and here's what I want you to remember. This word relates to great discomfort. And why is that? Well, Messiah, he is the comforter. You say, wait, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Yeshua. Read carefully in the book of John. And what we find concerning that third member of the Trinity is, yes, he comforts. Messiah is all about comfort. We see so many times, especially in this book of Isaiah, where Nehama, comfort, is related to the work of Messiah. But here, what are they experiencing? The lack of comfort. Verse 8. We see that, that the joy, the happiness will cease. It's the word Shabbat. Shabbat speaks to stopping. So the happiness, the joy will cease. The joy of the, the uh, tambourines or the, the drums. And also will seek the sound of joy. It will stop the sound of uh, or the noise of joy. The joy will cease from the, the violin. So no more joyful music. No more tambourines, drums, or violin. Everything stops. Why? Because God is displeased. God has been, and here's what's so important, God has been disrespected. So let me ask you, let's just pause for a moment and ask ourselves, does that describe me? And do I think in a way, speak in a way, behave in a way that disrespects God? If I do not submit to his rules, I am disrespecting him. And it's because this world for the large degree has been doing it and doing it and doing it that one day judgment comes and this is what isaiah is speaking to in this passage look now to verse 9 with a song they do not drink wine and strong drink has become bitter will be bitter to its drinkers so Wine and strong drink, usually associated with celebrations, rejoicing, banquets. No more. No more. Why? There's nothing to celebrate. There's nothing that is a source of joy. People no longer feel like there's a cause for separation. God's judgment has, has brought this about. Verse 10. And has been broken the, the city... Of confusion now confusion is related to the absence of God's order let me say it another way this word confusion tohu represents a lack of God's order or a rejection of God's purposes and because of that the world becomes broken it says the city of confusion and close up uh, the the every house from a one that enters so usually people in a happy society people visit one another but here the homes are going to be closed up there's not going to be any reason for your home to be open because no one's going to enter in no one's going to visit you no one's thinking about anything other than the suffering they're going through, experiencing this, this judgment. Verse 11. In the streets, they cry out concerning the wine. Wine is related to joy. The absence of joy causes them to cry out in the streets. And everyone who was glad, they have become gloomy or dark. And we see that the, the joy of the earth has gone into exile. Now, this is an important term, this word exile, because it relates, it's a reference to God's punishment. God's punishment for those who reject his purposes. And, and this is something, if I was teaching small children, 
I would talk about these two words, purpose and punishment. When you choose your purposes, you are inviting God's punishment into your life. But when you choose his purposes, you are inviting his provision into your life. And it's just that simple. And these are absolute laws. You follow his purposes, God's going to provide. You, you pursue your purposes, ignoring God's will, and you're going to experience punishment. It's truly that simple. God's spiritual laws don't take some Einstein to figure out. Therefore, even a small child can, can comprehend the principle at work here. Verse 12. Remains in the city desolation, and destruction has hit the gate. Now, this is also a Hebrew idiom. When the gate of a city is captured, it's an idiom meaning the city has been captured. So when it speaks about, look carefully at this, this verse. It says, remains in the city, destruction. And, and this destruction, it's a different word, but same concept. Remember, this is poetry, a lot of synonyms. And, and destruction has struck its gate, meaning the city is defeated. Verse 13. For thus will be in the midst of the world, in the midst of people. So what's happening to the world is also going to happen to the people. And what is God going to do as the shaking of a, an olive tree? Now, this is an idiom for harvesting. You want the olives, you shake the olive tree and the olives fall. They put uh, uh, blankets and such netting on the ground to gather up what falls. And harvest is related to the concept of payday. And, and payday is going to be one of two things. Either God looks upon your faithfulness and he pays you. Or he sees that you are a debtor. That you lack, lack the things of God. And therefore, what happens is, you're going to pay the price. That is, you're going to be a recipient of God's judgment, his destruction. That's what he's saying here. As the the fruit of the, 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 the fall, it is consumed at that time. At that time, end of verse 13, it speaks about the, the grapes at the end of the harvest period. That's why I say the fall at the end of the harvest period. Those grapes that, that didn't come ripe throughout the summer, usually early in the summer, late in the spring. But those grapes that never come to fruition, never mature, late in the summer, the fall comes and they are destroyed. That's what he's speaking about here. They're consumed. Verse 14. They lift up their voice. They, they shout in the majesty of, of the Lord, the, the waters rejoice. Now, what is it speaking about? When we come to verse 14, we're going to see a change. God has spoken abundantly in these first 13 verses about judgment. And now, at the, the appearance, people can see God's judgment upon the evil. Those things that were, were, were set against him, ignored his purposes. And now, because of that, there's going to be the sounds of rejoicing for God's righteous, righteous wrath that fell upon this world. And by the way, if you look and study the book of Revelation, that's exactly what you see. God pours out in a, a furious way his wrath. 
A consuming, a destroying wrath that leaves nothing behind. Ultimately, when he pours out those bowls, these vials, and what's the response of, of heaven to all of this destruction, pain, sorrow, death, and suffering? The heavens rejoice in God's righteous judgment. That's what the Word of God says. That's what's found in the New Testament. And because of that, I think that's why so many people ignore the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation will not allow a New Testament believer to hold on to false doctrine about how God is always loving, always gracious, always forgiving everyone. The universalists who teach about in the end everyone will be saved, they never, never, never study the book of Revelation. And if they do, they look at it as a book that speaks only about the past. This is not true Bible study. So verse 14, they lift up their voice, they shout in the majesty of the Lord, and they rejoice from the sea. Now, the sea, the roaring of the sea, speaks to the majestic nature of God, His majesty, His power, and such. Look at verse 15. Therefore, the valleys, what do they do? They honor the Lord. And the islands of the sea, what do they do? Well, most scholars teach this honoring is also applied not just to the valleys, but to the, the, the islands of the sea. They honor, they give glory to who? To the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, this is so significant because we do not see the God of Esau, the God of Palestine. We see, remember, this is a last day prophecy, the God of Israel. And this tells the reader God's faithful. God keeps covenant with his people. And God will bring about a change for the children of Israel, that they, a remnant, although two-thirds will be lost, there will be that one-third remnant that comes to faith, the same faith that every believer, true believer has in Messiah Yeshua. Verse, verse 6. From the ends, and this is where kanaf, kanaf is the corner, remember it's the same word for where the titsit, those fringe garments are placed on the four corners, but it speaks about the extremities, so those that are far away. So from the far points of the earth, we have a word, songs of praise, they are heard. And the beauty of the righteous one, I will say. Now, this is similar. Remember what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 6 when he received his call. He sees the majesty of God. And what does he say? He says, woe is me. His eyes looked upon the splendor, the holiness of the living God. And once more, this is what we see. When this glory of God is seen in the extremities of the earth as the outcome, the change, the transformation from his, his judgment, Isaiah says, I am, am, literally, it's a word for becoming theme. I am thin. I am being reduced, being reduced. Woe to me. Why? Because of the traitors. Those who have dealt treacherously, the betrayers. For they have, and the word for betraying, is in this verse one, two, three, four, five times. So it speaks about how Isaiah, when he looks and sees how the people have betrayed God, he is saying, woe is me. For the same reason, I live in the midst of a treacherous people. Verse 17. Isaiah goes back and speaks about how God's judgment is thorough. God's judgment is complete. No one, no one, no one escapes. 
only through a covenant. And that's why it says, verse 17, it's the word pachad, fear. It is a synonym for the word in English, terror. There is great fear that people are afraid, and there's the deep, deep pit and the snare and a trap. Unto, upon, in other words, concerning the, the dwellers of the earth. Now, when we've looked so far, we've completed the first 17 verses, and we've seen something. We've seen over and over, numerous times, the emphasis when we speak about those who are going to be, be consumed by the judgment of God, they are the dwellers, the inhabitants of earth. And that same term is, is used by John in the book of Revelation for those who once more are the recipients of God's judgment, his wrath. But those whose citizenship is in the heavens, in the kingdom of God, the redeemed of the Lord, they are not going to experience that. But those who belong the dwellers of the earth, notice what he says, verse 18. It will come about that the one who flees from the sound of, of fear or terror, it will fall upon him the, the valley. That is, he'll fall into, excuse me, not the valley, but the, the pit. And the one who goes up from the pit, he will be caught in the snare. So there's no real escape. You get out of one only to fall into another. Let me say this again properly. Verse 18. And it will come about the one that flees from the sound, the sound of fear. He will fall into the pit. And the one who gets up from the midst of the pit, the snare, the trap, will, will capture him. For the, and these are in modern English, we use this word as a chimney, where smoke goes up through out of a fireplace. But it's also used, for example, in, I believe, Malachi. It's spoke, spoken of there about how God will open up the windows of heaven. And here, it's not going up, smoke coming up, but it's something coming down from heaven. And therefore, he says, look at verse Verse uh, 18, the second part, for the heavens from on high will be open up and they will shake the foundations of the earth. That word shake is literally the word for noise. And a loud noise brings about shaking, a movement. And what's going to be the occurrence, the outcome of that? Look at verse 19. We have a word for, for the earth being broken and the earth wobbling, meaning a lack of stability, and it's going to, the earth is going to collapse. So those three things, it's going to be shaken, it is going to wobble, and it's ultimately the earth is going to collapse. Verse 20, another word for, for being shaken, a synonym of it, the earth will be, will be shaken as one who is drunk. And one will wonder, the earth will wonder about in a state of confusion as some will say a tent or a shack, a, a temporary resident, residence. Something that people stay in just for a short time while they're traveling so there's not much stability. And the, the heaviness upon it, upon this, this tent, because of, of, or the world, the, the heaviness upon the world because of the transgression. And the earth is going to fall and will no longer rise up. So those who belong to the earth, thinking in an earthly way, having a, a humanistic point of view and not a godly perspective. They are going to collapse, first shaken. They are going to, to wobble. 
They will be confused and, and go through places wondering about not having clear direction in their life. They will collapse, they will fall, and they will not rise up again. And what brought this? Their transgression. Verse 21. Now, we just have three verses left. And verse 21 has that, that hermeneutical clue. That is a phrase. Hermeneutics teach this. There are certain terms that appear over and over and give us an indication of something. And therefore, it says, look at verse 21. It will come about on that day that the Lord will visit. And this word visit, pekuf dalat, is a word that's translated a variety of different ways. It can mean visit in a good sense. It can mean redeem. It can mean assist. But it can also mean that God will punish and destroy. It all depends upon the state of the situation. If one merits a blessing, God will bless richly. If one deserves a curse, a destruction, a punishment, God will do that. But the word here means that God is all in. It is going to show his commitment to the manifestation of his character. So it will come about on that day. That is the last days. That's the implication, the end times. It's a time of judgment. That expression, beyom hahu. It will come about on that day the Lord will visit the exalted army. Now, some will say that this has to do with, with the Antichrist who will want to exalt himself up to fight a battle in the heavenly realm. So this is who he's speaking about here, according to most commentators. Look again, verse, verse 21. And it will come about on that day that the Lord will visit that exalted army. And from on high, and concerning the kings of the earth upon earth. So God, those who are in lofty places, God's going to judge those who are on low places in this earth. God's going to judge. What's it speaking about? God's judgment, his wrath, wrath is thorough. It is complete. No one, no one, no one is going to escape. Verse 22. And shall be gathered the, the prisoner concerning the pit, and they will be closed concerning the prison. So what it says here is the, the one, the prisoner, God's prisoner, is going to be in the pit, He's going to be placed in, in prison. It's going to be closed up for many days. They will be visited, meaning they will be punished. Now, when it says, Merov Yamin, many days, this is expression for eternity. That punishment is not going to come to an end. Many times in the scripture, you will find the word harbe, and this is a version of that, and it's speaking about, it's translated many, but it literally means in the context, all, every. It's a word of, of entirety, completeness. Verse, verse 23, our last verse. The moon is going to be ashamed. And then a synonym also meaning a shame will be the sun. So the sun and the moon are going to be a shame. Why? Well, remember, they ruled the night and the day. That's what we see in the book of Genesis. And, and these lights were to provide signs and seasons, instruction, illumination. But, but the world did not respond to that. They were not successful. People did not understand the moon and the sun give seasons and holidays. This all comes with, with revelation, truth. They did not bring about the change, so they were, were ashamed. And what's going to be the final outcome? And this is how we know it's a prophecy for the last days. It relates to the transition from this age into the kingdom of God because it says, Ki malach Hashem savot, for the Lord of hosts, he has reigned. What does that mean? It's in the past because 
speaks about once more complete entirety in fullness for in fullness completely the lord of hosts he will rule on mount zion and in jerusalem not in some other place there is a future a godly future a purpose for what we see here jerusalem known here as sion zion and he'll do so before his elders of holiness or glory or or honor now who are these elders of of glory well we only need to turn to the book of revelation to find out that they relate to the 12 tribes and they relate to the foundation of that are the 12 apostles what we speak of having to do with israel you cannot rightly understand God's purposes, God's plans, his prophetic revelation if you set Israel aside. And that's why replacement theologians, those who say such, such God offensive things such as the land of Israel has no more relevance. God's covenant with the Jewish people has been done away with. God's not going to bring the people back to the land even though we see it with our own eyes. I live in Israel, and the thing, one of the things that amazes me is the building and building and building that goes on because the people are returning back to the land exactly as God has said. Well, to me, this 24th chapter of Isaiah is a chapter of, of marvelous revelation of the faithfulness of God, this holy God, that, that commands us to be instruments that manifest his righteousness, his gloriousness, his glorious condition, so that world will know, people will know that there is a God, and his name is Yeshua. He is the only begotten son of the God of Israel. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.